الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <تصفيق> الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي انزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاه والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش افضل الانبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا ابي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى اله وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين I begin in Allah's name the beneficent the merciful and Allah commands us in the Quran in the 96th chapter which is surah al-alaq with regards to a command which we must do which is to read as you know this was the command given to the holy prophet to read to recite to ponder to reflect because qara'a in arabic has many meanings but the true the most generic meaning is this actual proactive reading looking reading referencing engaging the frontal lobe with critical thinking iqra you know bismillah rahman rahim iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq read in the name of thy lord who creates khalaq al insana min alaq he created man with that which clings alaq is the zygote the thing that clings and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially showing us our roots our origin how we came into this world and essentially laying the foundation in the quran that the purpose of this clinging creature that's going to come forth from this zygote that's going to form into flesh and bones and into a walking thinking proactive creature creation is that they should be ones who are proactively thinking and allah says allama bil qalam he taught mankind with the pen that which he did not know ma lam ya'lam so as i mentioned yesterday the month of ramadan which has been instituted as a divine injunction upon mankind for all of mankind to follow but specifically to the believers that it has been enjoined for us to fast kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba ala alladhina min qablikum like it was enjoined before because that's the proactive nature of the creator when he places us on this earth he gives us rules and regulations by which to improve ourselves So from a very universal perspective if we ask the question why did Allah create us he created us purely because he is merciful he is an eternal being he has no beginning no end and it's logical and rational that such a god should exist for we know we all have a beginning and while we may continue to exist eternally it's impossible unless the one that created us is the one who is eternal that means our eternity is dependent on the eternal one otherwise it's impossible but the fundamental question we ask is how did we come into existence if there was no being that was always there and that answer is clearly shows clearly shows the answer to that is that it's impossible to exist unless there is a being that always existed this rational thinking is purely in the rational state and it can be mathematically shown so to answer this in a very universal way first and foremost allah created us purely out of his mercy and the fact that he is eternal he is infinite we know that his qualities all have positive qualities for existential thoughts demand positive existence all negative existences that we think of which are negative are all subsets of the positive meaning that when you look at the negatives they all come under the relative world for when you have positive existence in the relative world and i don't want to go too deep into this allah allows the opposite to exist subhanalladhi khalaqal azwaja kullaha blessed is he who creates everything in pairs if you bring it down to its lowest common denominator the pairs is the opposite so you notice that there's always two sides to the coin to everything two sides to the coin 
God exists, God doesn't exist. You are good, you're not good. You see, there's, there, every thought in general has opposites. So the question we ask is, does God have a negative? God is all good, we say, but could he be all bad? We say God is all good, could he be all evil? In the absolute world, it's impossible. For the eternal being can either be one or the other. It cannot be both because the, rel the relative being has sides. The absolute being has no sides. The absolute being, the eternal being, is only the absolute, meaning there is no flip side to him. So the question we ask is, is God all good or lack of it? You will notice, and I'm going to bring a very simple argument here, we talk about existence. I want you to think about it. If I ask any human being, is existence good? You and I exist. We're made, we exist. I have a personality, I'm a person. And the thought in my mind of me not existing is very painful. It's a painful thought. Atheists will tell you, it's a very painful thought knowing that we're going to become non-existent. Because all our existence now is negated with the thought of non-existence. If I know I'm not going to exist tomorrow, then my existence now gets negated because I have no reason to exist. The only reason that makes sense to exist is it must have an eternal journey of what we call eternal existence. So listen to the following. An existent being can talk about non-existence. You agree? We can say non-existence. But can a non-existent entity talk about existence? Never. Impossible. Notice evil cannot exist without good. Just like lie, a lie is an evil entity. When you lie, it's not good. It cannot exist without truth. There is no such thing as a lie without truth. Impossible. It's absurd. But a truth doesn't need a lie to exist. I am Hassanain. It's the truth. There needs not be a lie for me to say that. But when something is a lie, there's a truth. So we know that in the absolute world, God is all good. For evil cannot exist without good, but good can exist without evil. So we say that Allah is all good, and therefore all good includes Asma'ul Husna, who al awwal, who al akhir, who al dair, who al batin, al rahman, al rahim, jabbar, mutakabbir. All the qualities of God which we give, which are the absolute good, belong to Allah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. When we understand that, now we realize, ah, I see why I exist. So my existence had to have been predicated by an absolute good being who would never create me if my existence was not good. For an all good being only creates that which is good. Otherwise, it's a contradiction. That's why Allah in the Quran says, Allah, ahsan al khaliqeen. Blessed is He who creates everything good. Alladhi ahsana kulla shayin khalaqa. He creates everything good. So my existence is good. Your existence is good. The existence of everything, including poison, including black holes, including iblis, including hell, is all good. Good. That's why we exist. So when we understand that, now we realize that when he created me, he is absolutely good. He put a mind in me and he has given me the power to imagine you know, we have four powers. Quwwati aqaliyya, shahwiyya, wahamiyya, wa ghadabiyya. Four major powers we have. The power of intellect, quwwati aqaliyya, quwwati shahwiyya, the power of desire. For if I lack desire, I will not move towards anything, positive or negative. When you have a child who lacks desire, it's more painful than a child who desires something bad. For when they desire something bad, you can redirect it to good. But if they lack desire, there is nothing you can do with it. So the power of desire is a blessing of God.
شهوية وهمية the power of imagination, thought, illusions making up things in the future that don't exist yet the power to imagine it's brilliant for without this power you and I would have no imagination there'd be no creativity there'd be no growth there'd be no planning for the future there'd be no action today to prevent damage for tomorrow nor action to promote tomorrow for there would be no imagination for tomorrow and the power of anger to animate us to be up upholders and promoters of justice ya ayyuhal ladina amanu kunu qawwamina lillahi bil qist stand upright kunu qawwamina in the way in the way of your lord with justice wa la yajrimannakum shana'anu qawman ala an la ta'dilu i'dilu huwa aqrabu lit taqwa وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Stand upright, be promoters of justice, and do not let your hatred for a thing skew, or meaning remove you from your obligation to be just. We are honored to have a judge, President Hajda David Turfa, you know, who is a judge in Dearborn Heights. He understands that when you are a justice, doesn't matter which side the prosecution or the defense don't hate either side justice is justice allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wala yajrimannakum shana'an qawmin ala an la ta'dilu do not let hatred for something skew your justice system balance it how if you if you don't have that desire that power to fight for justice where there is injustice there is this level of anger that drives you to want to correct the situation the four powers and allah has blessed us with these four powers because he's almighty he's all merciful and he has planted this phenomenal engine within us to enact us for a purpose see alladhi khalaqal mauta wal hayata liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala wa huwa al azizul ghafur he created death and life to test which of you is best in deeds he is mighty forgiving why ghafur because this test liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala is not easy who is going to be good in action who is going to be good in demeanor who is going to be a moral upright individual who's going to abstain from the evils of society allah says i am mighty for i can certainly capture you but i am forgiving for i know you will fail so don't lose hope in me even if you don't do something right don't lose hope in me so tonight's lecture is in the continuity to yesterday's that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instituted social worship besides individual worship ramadan is a social worship while we are individual and while we have individuality within our fasting while this individual fasting enhances and it takes us towards greater uh, realizations and to become more self aware but the social demeanor the social implication of a collection of people doing it simultaneously amplifies this reality infinitely greater and that's why i said the religion of allah when allah says inna ad-din 'inda allah al-islam the religion to allah is al-islam is precisely for this reason that god has instituted what we call communal obligations hijab for example hijab the sisters wear and the brothers so are supposed to observe by lowering their eyes is a communal command you don't wear hijab in the house when you come in public hijab becomes obligatory for us we lower our eyes as men when we come to in public among those who are not uh, of our own families right lower your eyes it becomes what we call communal relations jamaa is communal for we pray together hajj is communal notice god could have set hajj as an obligation upon us any time of the year but you would have not been amplified as in the month of hajj for the first 10 days why communal amplify it but there is this individuality 
So you notice that the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in giving us the month of Ramadan is not only for the individual self to improve, but at the community level. We must abstain from backbiting, from fault finding, from negative thoughts. We must think positively. We must appreciate the social demeanor of people. We must be appreciative of those around us that somebody's sitting next to me. And usually, you know, when you have a gathering and only a few people show up, we get disappointed sometimes. Oh, very few people showed up. It's not about the numbers, but that is true, that the more people show up, the more enhanced we feel like, wow, this was a great program. Look, thousands of people came. It must be important. Numbers do count, although sometimes we've gotten lost with numerics by trying to present arguments because more people show up. No. That's not the reason. What we as believers should want more people is when we all get together to do good. The more, the merrier. To do good. But if it is to be in a concert where we're going to do silly, evil things, then the less, the better. Right? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Quran. Shahru Ramadan, as I mentioned yesterday. In verse 184, Surah Al-Baqarah, and 185, Shahru Ramadan, الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ Right? هُدًا لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتِ مِنَ الْهُدَىٰ وَالْفُرْقَانِ Now Allah is describing Ramadan as a month in which the Quran was revealed, which is a guidance for mankind. So you notice the Quran now becomes our central source of the enactment of this machinery which God has placed within us, the four powers he has given us, and the self with journeys towards higher stages, nafs al-ammara, nafs al-lawwama, nafs al mutmainna These are the three main stages of the self that must evolve. And God said, when I first create you, I give you this self called ammara. وَمَا أُبَرِّئُ نَفْسِ إِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ إِلَّا مَا رَحِيمَ رَبِّي By this self, which has a desire to deviate, except by the mercy of God, does it come back into its proper vision. For it was created due to the infinite mercy of God for this being to function within this machinery to elevate itself so that it continues to receive the eternal mercy and blessings of God eternally. But in the process, it should also work through its limited free will to elevate itself. So to answer the first question, why did God create us? He created us purely out of his mercy. And when he did, he implanted in us the capacity by which you and I can grab and take the best blessings and to elevate ourselves to the highest stations, inshallah, which Quran calls maqam e mahmud which is an eternal abode of happiness, of eternal blessings, because there is nothing more that you and I should ever think of than to be in the wellspring of God's infinite divine mercy, which he wills to shower upon us eternally. Allah in the Quran says, Kataba ala nafsi rahma I have enjoined upon myself mercy. For God is merciful. And under mercy, you have love, you have justice, you have caring, sharing, giving, forgiving. All of the characters that you and I should have come under the protocols of mercy. So how do we achieve mercy in this blessed month of Ramadan? And I'd like to focus on one, which is the power of reading. For when we read, when we recite, the benefits of reading. In the first command of Allah, as you know, let me describe this very briefly. I'll discuss it further later. But there are five stages of the Holy Quran. Five. The first stage is the pre-existential stage. It's not on the uh, slide, but I'm just saying it. The pre-existential stage. The second stage is the entire Quran in spirit, in its essential nature, was revealed into the heart of the Prophet. Then Allah revealed the structured Qur'an into the heart of the Prophet. So the Prophet knew exactly how the Qur'an was. Then Allah revealed it to deliver it to mankind in stages. And then the Qur'an was collected by the Prophet and delivered and left to the people before his departure. And the Prophet says, إِنِّي تَارِكٌ 
فيكم الثقلين كتاب الله وعترة أهل بيتي. I leave you two heavy things: the book of God and your obedience and attachment to my near ones. Two things. He didn't say I'm going to leave scriptures in which, inshallah, tomorrow you'll collect it and hopefully you'll put it together in the right way. You know, no. Quran was put together by Allah and delivered. Allah says, "Wa inna alayna jamahu wa Qurana." It is upon us to collect it and to recite it. But please understand that the first command among those, those stages of scriptures, after the Prophet received it, was to deliver it to mankind in the in the cave of, of what they call Jabal Nur, cave Hira. On the outskirts of Mecca, the Prophet was waiting for his commission to begin. At the age of 40, Jibreel comes to him and he was not a stranger to the Holy Prophet. This idea that the Prophet was shaking, he thought the devil spoke to him, he wanted to commit suicide, he wanted to jump off the mountain. These are concoctions, fictitious concoctions designed to belittle the Prophet. And if you want to see the remnants of this, with all due respect, go back to the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible and the Torah, you will see prophets are so humiliated. And the stuff that they did in those scriptures is so repulsive. And I would say the modus operandi of an evil institution is to go and attack the general who represents the army. The representative of God on earth are the prophets and the imams. What better to marginalize the religion of God than to take the representative and debase them and make them look foolish. For then the psychology says, if this representative of God couldn't get it right, then why should I even bother to get it right? Isn't that the case? That's the reality of life. But Allah in the Quran, you will find one masterful situation in the Quran is, Every prophet, 25 of them are mentioned by name. We have 124,000 of them. Every one of them is elevated, protected. And when Allah speaks about them, even when he approaches their, their situation, sometimes every once in a while, it may appear that God is rebuking the prophet or it may appear that God is reprimanding the prophet. He is not. He is not. Read it carefully between the lines and you will see, no. Allah elevates them, honors them to such levels that Allah in Surah Al-Ahzab says, An-Nabiyyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet, An-Nabiyyu awla, has greater authority on the believers than the believers have on themselves. That's a great honor. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا your messenger is your best role model, best example. You can't go further than him. So this debasement of the prophet is critical for you and I to avoid because God said my chain of command and my structure to strengthen your belief and for you to become more pliant and submissive and to understand my mercy, you must honor my representatives. And if you dishonor them, by the way, in the state of fasting, the Sharia states, the rule of Islamic law states that if you malign Allah and or the Holy Prophet while fasting, your fasting is nullified. That's how severe it is to malign the Prophet. So the Prophet is in the cave of Hira. Jibreel comes to him and tells him, Iqra, recite. The Prophet recites because he knew it, he was waiting, and he recites, Iqra, bismi rabbika ladhi khalaq. Now you and I must pay attention for the first thing God does when he delivers it to mankind, that must be highlighted and circled and say, this must be crucial. You ask any pedagogues in the world, educational experts, and there's a few in this room right now, there are a few in this room, they will tell you unequivocally, if there is one thing that is essential in the progress of a child's education and their acumen to understand knowledge, it is reading. For reading has been unanimously exposed that it is the most powerful thing a person can do in life. Look how merciful Allah is, that while he's instituting his religion upon us, 
he's also enjoining upon us to read. This is the month of Ramadan. Which month? The month in which the Quran was revealed. Allah addresses Ramadan as the month of the Quran. Why? Because it is the month which you and I need to read. You and I need to reflect. Lest you and I become one of those the Prophet will complain on Judgment Day. When the Prophet will say, hmm? The Prophet will say, My community, Inna qawmi takhadu hadha al-Qur'ana mahjura. Qala Rabbi, huh? my Lord, my community ignored this book. Not only did they not ponder over it, not only did they not read it, okay, they ignored it. Mahjura. Inna qawmi takhadu hadha al-Qur'ana mahjura. They took it away. So how do we strengthen it? You know, there's a beautiful story of the two people cutting the trees in the forest. You notice, by the way, reading. What is reading? Let's give some analogies. By the way, Quran is replete with analogies. Allahu mathalan. Allahu al nas. We're giving you a similitude and understanding. La'allakum yatadakkaroon. Yatafakkaroon. So you think, you understand. For through reading, through reflection, the mind gets sharper. And what are the byproducts? We'll talk about it. What are, the, what are the byproducts of reading before I end this? But look at the mercy of Allah. And I want us to understand. And you know, when you and I are fasting, we tend to have more time. Generally, okay, I can't, I can't go there. I can't have lunch. Okay, I've got time. What are you going to do? Well, I can't do this and I can do this, but I cannot. So you are now acutely aware of do's and don'ts. Good. How about now you engage in reading? They have done studies to show how the human brain becomes very, very pro productive and sharp. It becomes very, very critical in understanding. The frontal lobe energy levels increase dramatically when you start to read. Critical thinking, like they say, fine motor movement increases frontal lobe activity. Zikr, tasbih. So two lumberjacks are chopping wood in the forest. It's a great analogy we use. And it's an eight hour day, but one was always cutting more trees than the other. But the interesting thing was that the one who cut more trees was the one who would take a, a, a break. 15 minute break, whatever, would take a break. But the one, the other one would not take a break because he wanted to maximize his output. So he was constantly chopping, constantly chopping. Now, from intuitive thinking, you would think that the one who's constantly chopping should be the one who cuts more trees. But actually, the one who takes the break cut more trees. So the other one was curious. Why is it that this person takes, always takes a break after a few hours, but he has cut more trees than I have? This is an analogy. Allah says, Every day there is a sign from me. Which of my bounties will you belie me for? So he asked the other one. He says, why do you take a break? He said, I sharpen my axe. Because as I'm hitting it, it's getting blunt. So by sharpening, I was more efficient. And my strokes were less because I was able to cut more trees than you did. The analogy is you and I are mundane in the world. We're constantly chasing the Joneses, trying to build our empires and build our palaces and have a big bank account. But we never stop to sharpen our axes. We never stop to think and reflect and to meditate and introspect and to cogitate and to read the prescriptions of God on how to become efficient in how we should achieve greatness. So look at this month, 11 months, we're busy recycling ourselves. God says, stop the machinery, reverse it, sharpen your blades, tune yourselves up, flush out your digestive system, flush out the negative thoughts, start thinking positive. Hopefully for the 11 months, you will be more efficient. Isn't it beautiful? Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. 
Another good example, you find people have bad habits. And sometimes when you have a bad habit, you can't think about it. You just get so used to it. And it's usually triggered due to tension, stress. We try to eliminate stress, so we learn a behavior, either to twitch or we do something. And that sort of distracts us temporarily. And now we start to associate relief of tension with the act. And it starts to become habitual, you know. So you start to become very uh, obsessed with it. As they say, compulsive. It's an obsession after that. I need to. Because when I do this, I have this feeling that I'm now uh, calming myself. People who smoke, for example, they've got to have a cigarette. Uh, you, the minute they're thinking, give me a cigarette. Did anybody have a cigarette? I got, I got, why? Oh, it calms me down. The cigarette is killing you. Secondhand smoke is killing 10 times more. Argila is killing 100 times more. But I got to have it. Why are you trying to? He said, I'm trying to solve my, my stress. You're creating 100 more stress problems, but you're being caught in this silly game. Why? No reflection, no meditation. The minute you tell them, by the way, smoking argila is bad. No, I don't like you anymore. Don't tell me this. I, my whole business is dependent on that. You know, it's interesting. A young boy came to me and I told, I was telling my whole student group, the kindergartners. I said, when you go home and if you see your parents smoking this, ask them the following question. I said, do you love me? I said, Habibi, of course I love you. The child says, can you please stop doing this because it's killing me. So one boy came to me today smiling. He says, I told that to my parents. And they told me, get, get away. We don't, we don't want to hear you. Brother, it didn't work. Notice how we are so addicted to this little twitch, to this little crutch, that even our loved ones, where we will give our hearts and our kidneys and our liver to them, but for that moment when I'm having that rush, don't talk to me because you're reminding me of something I don't want to think about. It's like people who are playing Arbamiya or playing cards. Talk to them. Excuse me, I was thinking, does God exist? And they look at you like, excuse me? That's the exit? Get out? Why? Because I'm having, I'm, I'm, I'm in a thoughtless act. But for what? Well, I'm going to win some funny money, which will eventually become real money, which then eventually will take me to the casinos, which will eventually, eventually get me to the suite, you know, the grand suite up there. I'm going to have the best. Shaitan fools you. Why? No meditation, no reflection, no understanding of purpose in life. Just be Pavlovian. That, that bell rings, you start to salivate and wag your tail. We've become Pavlovian. And Allah is taking us away from this Pavlovian idea. He said, don't be that dog that lulls its tongue. When you are a human being, can you compare the one who grovels his or her face on the ground to the one who is upright, visionary, with, an, with a thought for the future and planning their strategies and avoiding the poisons of society in thought and in action and in consumption to something greater for tomorrow? For that is what we were created for. Shaitan says, but that's not good. Such thoughts are not good. For if you start meditating and reflecting and reading, then you will stop following me. But I want you to follow me impulsively like a bull that charges towards a red fabric with the matador. For no reason. Reflection. So here's a person who's biting their nails. No thought. This is dirt. Why? If you look at them, some of them have no nails. They're literally biting skin now. I've seen people with no nails. And I said to them, why are you doing this? I'm stressed. I said, okay, how are we going to stop this? You're going to mark each time you put your hand in your mouth. So Badr Hussain experimented that and said to her sister, okay, you're very addicted to this. Do you want to stop? She said, yes. By the way, the first question you have to ask is, do you want to stop? If you and I are not willing to accept our problems, that's why Allah says, La uqsimu bin nafs lawama. I swear by the self accusing soul. self. The self accuser. Uqsimu bin nafs lawama. The one who says, I am a problem. I have a problem. Therefore, I am the solution. I have the solution. If you and I don't think that way, I promise you, you and I will never cure ourselves. 
If a doctor gives you a prescription, we will throw it in the trash. Gives us medicine, we will throw it in the trash. Because if I don't believe I'm sick, why should I take anything? And people who indulge in self-destruction, in talk, in thought, in actions, if they do not come to terms with it, they will never change. So now you say to this person, do you want to stop? Yes, I really want to stop. Okay, here's how you're going to do it. You're going to increase your awareness of it. It's no longer going to be a habit where you are going to do it without thought. You're going to put thought into it. You're going to read it. You're going to read your action. So every time this girl did this, she would mark it. She would mark it. And I think the image shows here. The first time, the first day, you notice how many? 56 times in a 24-hour period. That's a lot. Bear in mind, seven, eight hours you are sleeping. She was not doing that. That's a lot. But she became acutely aware. Oh my God, I didn't realize I do so much. That's all it takes. This is where shaitan says, no, no, no. I don't want you to be aware. Quran, Allah says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءَ وَرَحْمَةُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ What we have revealed in this Quran is a shifa and a rahmah. Why? It exposes the good and it exposes the evil and it shows the value of the right versus the wrong. Quran is a masterful book when it comes to the power to enable us to imagine a perfect future tomorrow. If I have time, I'll discuss it. What you find is this person started reducing every single day, started going down all the way, and there's a date there. And on Thursday, she, she did it three times, from 56 times to three times. Notice how practical it is. What's the answer to that? Just be acutely aware of these behaviors. But how do you go there? You had to have somebody tell you, hey, why are you biting your nails? Oh, I didn't know that. Somebody has to make you aware. Just like it's Salat time. Are you going to pray? Oh, I have to pray? Oh, yeah. Allah says, فَذَكِّرْ إِن نَفْعَةِ الذِّكْرَى سَيَذَّكَّرُ مَنْ يَخْشَى وَيَتَجَنَّبُهَا الْأَشْقَى Remind them. Reminding is beneficial. Allah says, Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Invite them to the way of your Lord. Bil hikmah with wisdom. Wal mawidatil hasana. With kind exhortation. Welcome them. But be a good role model. Welcome them. Don't be condescending. Don't be pejorative in what you say. Be, con be nice, kind, general. Invite them. Remind them. Let them have that warm, fuzzy feeling of doing good things. Just like when you and I do bad things, it's because we got a warm, fuzzy feeling in it. That's why we want it again and again and again. Flip it. Now what you find is the minute you become aware of it, you escape it. And the minute you escape it, for the rest of your life you won't do it. Because now you are a master of what not to do. Islam is a religion that trains me. When Allah says, Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar wala dhikrullahi akbar Salah keeps you away from wrongdoing and evil. Inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar wala dhikrullahi akbar It is the best dhikr. Why? Quran reminds me of what's bad. Quran reminds me of how to avoid bad. Quran reminds me of how to be good. So when we do takbir, you notice within that sentence we say, Sarat al ladina an'amt alayhim. Ihdina sarat al mustaqim. Guide me on the right path. Which path? The path of those you have chosen. Meaning God says, set your goals high. Who are you going to follow? Because if you don't follow someone, you are not alive. There's no human being who does not follow someone. Even atheists will tell you, I follow that atheist and I like this theist and I like that agnostic. You cannot avoid following somebody or a group of people. Impossible. As long as you're alive, cognizant, individual on this earth, it's impossible. Having said that, you and I now have to make a choice that there are 8 billion people, but relatively mediocre when it comes to guidance. Quran says it, Most of mankind doesn't know, they don't think. So then you know, Sirat al ladina and Amta alayhim are an exclusive group of people, which Allah mentions in the Quran 25, and we have 124,000 of them, from Adam to the Holy Prophet. 
and they're all very important, and they have impacted our society, that when you look at civility on earth today, it's because of their presence. Otherwise, humans would not have had this kind of civility in our nature. While we have a natural civility, without guidance, it's impossible. Just like I give you an example, put a bunch of kids in a room and don't monitor them and see what you get. Chaos. Why? Human nature demands guidance, particularly in morals and particularly in civility. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent prophets with a perfect demeanor and amta alayhim. Read the next two verses. Ghayril maghdubi alayhim not those who invoke your wrath. So notice in, Sur in Surah Al-Fatiha, we say, not those who invoke your wrath. Who are they? The ultra evil doers. The ones who indiscriminately kill. The presidents who are so narcissistic, which we have one today, who thinks there's nothing greater in the universe than himself. Right? Pharaoh was like that self-indulgent, self-aggrandizing, narcissistic pontificator, as we call them, absolutely drunk with their selves, they invoke the wrath of God due to their intense arrogance. Iblis is a good example. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ Not those. وَلَطَّالِينَ And not those who are lost. With all due respect, the human race is a beautiful race. But let's face the facts. When it comes to the real substance and the meat and potatoes of what life is all about, it's not easy to find it. It's not easy to get the guidance, with all due respect. And I go to speak in some of the most prestigious elite universities in the world, and I do sit with some of the most learned pundits in their respective fields. But when you sit with them, no matter how long you sit with them, you will learn one thing about their expertise and it will be a great help without a doubt. But to get that holistic vision of what is wrong and right in the vision of the divine in a holistic way? Probably not. Experience probably is our best teacher. And maybe our teachers among our parents and within our scholarly work is the greatest. But I'm telling you, the guidance the Quran has given me, Tilka ayatu kitab al hakim, hudan wa rahmatan lil muhsineen. These are the verses from a book that is wise. تِلْكَ آيَاتُ كِتَابِ الْحَكِيمِ هُدًا وَرَحْمَةً A guidance and a mercy for the good doers. لِلْمُحْسِنِينَ What an elegant set of verses. Quran is constantly repeating itself under these parameters. Okay, so in conclusion, within the time that I have, you find that what are the benefits of reading? And the reason I say this, that you and I should read, because reading reduces so many problems. Reading increases so many capacities. And one of the powers of reading is when you and I read, we become very imaginative. You know, when I'm on a plane, there are two kinds of people, and I don't judge them, but it's a choice I make. You'll see some on the phone playing silly games like blowing bubbles or dropping balls, or something. Kids like to do that. Why? I'm bored. I said, if only you knew how short this world is. It's okay, you're young. The Prophet said, my believers are never bored. Never bored. Because they've taken into account the values. But when a child is playing it, I don't blame them. We haven't given them that value. We haven't shown them capacities. So now they're filling in the voids with playing silly games. But then they'll be the one with the book on the plane, reading. It's an eight hour flight, they're reading. And you watch them, they'll eat, they're back to reading. I said, I like that. I am sure if I sit with that person, I will gain a lot. Because that person will probably tell me what books to read, what not to read, and they will be opinionated and they will tell me things that the average cannot tell me. A reader is always superior to the non-reader. Now, we all agree reading is good, whether it's fiction, non-fiction, whether it's documentary, whatever it is, it's healthy, read it, it's good. Read books by non-Muslims, read books by Muslims, read books of other religions, read. Knowledge is power. The Prophet said, Utlu bil ilm min al mahd il al lahd. Acquire knowledge from the cradle to the grave. The Prophet said, even if you have to go to China, walau kana seen, go, get it, for knowledge enhances your capacity. Knowledge takes you to higher stages. You will become a better person. Did you notice, by the way, 
readers usually have very good vocabulary. It's interesting sometimes you speak to high schoolers and you use a simple word and they look at you and say, what does that word mean? Or when you see them write, even emails, or write on a board, they can't spell correctly. Why? You can tell this is not a reader. A reader will not make those simple mistakes. A reader is acutely aware of the difference between one word over another. That's the sign of a reader. So we all agree unanimously that those who read are superior in society. They tend to be wiser. They tend to have more patience. Studies have shown that nuns in their 80s have brains of 4, 30 and 40 year olds. Nuns. Because for two reasons. They are avid readers and they are constantly in worship being grateful to God and worshiping him for his greatness. When you are appreciative in your worship, when you do dhikr, Allah says, salah keeps you away from wrongdoing and evil. That's one aspect. You keep away from the bad doers, the ones who don't know. You focus on the ones who know. You make them as your goal in life. But because you're doing dhikr, you're more positive. You have less stress. Allah says, Allah bi dhikr Allahi tatma'inna al إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Who are the ones? Allah says, my believers are the ones when they hear the name of God, their hearts become pliant, palpitating. They love it. They're in love. The beloved is being spoken about. What? You said, what did you say about my beloved? You said something about something, someone I love. My heart starts to become active. And then when the verses of the Quran are recited, their faith increases. You know what is Iman? Iman, the root word is Amana. You know what Amana means? Security. When God says, Oh, you who are secure, Ya oh, you who are secure. If there's one thing you and I should go home tonight and say, What is one thing I want in life? You say, I want peace. Well, you can't get it if you don't have security. Security brings peace. Security, peace. What is my religion called? Islam. Root word, salama. Salama means what? Peace. Oh, wow. I am swimming in peace and security. What does the word taqwa mean? You know what taqwa means? The root word is waqaya. The root word of taqwa means protection. In other words, you're guarding yourself from any bad things. Ittaqillah means God says, guard yourself, protect yourself. Put the alarm, lock the door, be careful. The carcinogens are around you. The danger is around you. Okay? So, fasting helps us to guard. Prayer helps us to guard. Communal prayer amplifies the guarding a thousand times more. And I conclude on this one. The benefits of reading. Two and a half times less likely to get Alzheimer's. You know Alzheimer's is memory loss. In other words, two and a half times less. Okay? with reading. Uh, just like when you go to work out in the gym, that's for your body, reading is for the brain. It keeps your brain young, as I mentioned the nuns, 80 year olds, or their brain is like 30, 40 year olds. Huge, that's big, that's very important. Reading can melt away stress by 68%, 68% stress just by reading. Okay, so we're all agreeing, and look, I'm gonna end with this. You'll find that reading boosts your vocabulary, it improves empathy. You become more aware. You can start to feel others. Oh yeah, I remember I read that book about China and the, yeah, you know, you're trying, oh, I read it. I can imagine where you are. And then of course it encourages life goals. Did you notice by the Quran is filled with future goals? It shows me images and I'll talk about the power of imagination tomorrow in Surah Al-Waqiyah. Surah number 56, Surah Al-Waqiyah. إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَ لَيْسَ لِوَقَعَتِهَا Kathiba. Allah is describing this great event. What will happen? It's filled with these imagine, you know, Im, uh, imaginations of truth. And Allah wants me to understand it. He says, because through this understanding, through your reading, your mind will become sharp, and now you'll start to see reality in your head, and the power to project the future is in that. So I conclude on this. We all agree reading any book is the greatest thing to do. If there's any challenge here, raise your hand. I'm more than happy to be challenged. Of course not. 
But look at this. Reading the Quran, which is the book of God, which is supplants all reading in the world, is superior to all reading, for there is no greater reading than the words of God. Isn't it? For there is, you can read every book in the world, but at the end of the day, nothing is more important than the words of God. Nothing is important for the words of God about me and my future and my life and my successes and the foundation of all the other books I will read. So please let's end with this tonight. If we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let me start reading. If there's one way to read a lot, when you read even a paragraph, talk about it. You sit with your friends, pick up the phone. Hey, by the way, listen, I've been reading this great book. Can we have coffee sometimes or tea? Let's go out for lunch. I want to talk about this. Have reading circles. You know, we have Quran, Tafsir, discussion classes. You know how powerful that is? When we all sit around and we read one ayah, one surah, and we're discussing it. Even if you know the surah, I know some of these surahs by heart, and I sit in these in this sessions, and I say, oh my God, I never thought of this. You're right. I never thought of that. You're right. Somebody else says something. Somebody says, and next thing you know, it's enhancing what you've already read to higher depths. But if you haven't read it, it introduces you. Yes, and also, by the way, when you're reading, if you have difficulty reading, put your finger on it. It helps you focus. And by the way, if you read 40 to 45 minutes a day, you will complete a book in, in a week or two. Okay, a book a week you'll be able to. You become a speed reader. I did studies in reading, dyslexia versus reading, the general reading. You find that the speed reader is a hunter. They're actually reading a whole paragraph at one time. They're looking for the idea. That's why good, prolific writers will structure the word so perfectly that the reader sees the entire image in one shot. That's what makes a good, reader from, a good writer from a not good writer. So get into the practice, become good readers, our vocabulary will get better, our attention levels will go down, right? All of the above that we mentioned, and what better to read most of and more of than the Quran. وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم إنا نرغب إليك في دولة كريمة تعز بها الإسلام وأهله وتذل بها النفاق وأهله وتجعلنا فيها من الدعاة لا تعتك والقادة لا سبيلك وترزقنا بها كرامة الدنيا والآخرة والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلى الله على محمد وعلى محمد وصلي على محمد Inshallah, we will have Salah at 9 o'clock.